Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. How many of you like to fight? Oh, maybe I should say, yeah. Maybe I should say this this way. How many of you used to like to fight? A few more hands, but you know there's still part of you inside of you that still likes it. You'll, you'll provoke a fight every now and then. You'll pick a, even if it's just with your wife to get, you know, you just, you'll do it. And, there, and there's some people, man, you thrive, you thrive off of, off of fights. And if it's not you personally wanting to fight, you like to watch the fight. So maybe that's a better question. How many of you like to watch the fight? Whether it's boxing, MMA, right, whatever it is, uh, you're, you're, you're watching the fights. And, and what I want to talk about today is the fight of your life, the fight of your life. Finally, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. I'm reading out of the NIV. Scripture says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12, for our struggle, everybody say struggle, struggle. Say the struggle is real. Verse 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 13, therefore, put on the full armor of God, so so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. 14, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Verse number 17, and here's where I want us to focus. Taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the The word of God. Look, if you're going to be in the fight of your life, you need to understand that God has given you weapons. If you're going to be engaged in the fight of your life, we need to understand that we have a powerful arm. We have a powerful weapon at, at our disposal. God in his awesome strength, wisdom, sovereignty, power. He knew the struggle that we were going to be up against. He knew that the struggle was going to be real. He knew that we were going to be engaged in battle. And and he did not leave us armless, defenseless. He left us with a powerful weapon, which is the word of God. And the scripture says that we have been given the sword of the spirit. Now, if we're given the sword of the spirit, there's, there's very real reasons why. And I want you to write these reasons why. Here's the first reason why God has given us a sword. God has given us a sword because in life we will have to fight battles. God has given us the sword of the Spirit, which is His Word, because God knows that in this life we're going to have to fight battles. As a matter of fact, if you go to verse 11 over this passage of Scripture that we just read, this entire passage, I mean, indicates to us, it is telling us that we are engaged in battle. You may have come here today, and you might, you might be saying in my mind, I don't want to fight anybody. I'm not in it. You know, I don't want any of that drama. Let me just tell you something. The moment, that, the moment that you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, the drama began. The drama began. The struggle began. And you may be thinking, listen, you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, I know, right? You know, my husband is full of drama. Or, yeah, I know, right? My wife is full of drama. Or, yeah, I know, right? My kids are full of drama. My, 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 my grandkids are full of drama. Or my neighbors are full of drama. My work coworkers are full of drama. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The problem is not with them. The problem is with the spirit that is in operation in this world. It is the spirit of the evil one. It is the spirit of darkness. And we cannot bring that spiritual battle into physical realm, into the natural realm. We have to understand that the warfare that we wage, the battle that we're engaged in is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. So the drama began, the struggle began the moment that you surrendered your life to Christ. But look at verse 11. Over and over and over again, the scripture is indicating to us that we are engaged in this battle. Look what it says. It says, put on the full armor of God. Armor is not needed unless you are about to go into battle. It says, so that you can take your 
stand. Those are military terms. To take your stand, to be grounded. Those are terms that are utilized in warfare against the devil's schemes. That word right there refers to the tactics of the enemy, to the strategies of the enemy, to the attacks of the enemy. Verse 12 says, for our struggle. Struggle is another term for battle, our warfare. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against, the word there is rulers. Rulers indicates that there is another kingdom that is at work. And we are in warfare against those who are ruling this other kingdom. It says that our warfare is against the authorities. That means that in this kingdom, there are certain entities that have been authorized to carry out the agenda and the plans and the strategies of that kingdom. Our warfare is against them. It says that our, our struggle is against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces. I don't know what kind of forces they may be that are coming up against you. Maybe they're like the the, the Marie, you know, the SEAL Team 6 of the kingdom of darkness that is up against you today. I don't know if it's the green berets that are up against you today, but the scripture is telling us that our warfare is against the forces of darkness, of evil in the heavenly realm. In other words, here's what you and I need to understand, that as believers and as Christians, it is inevitable you are going to have a battle on your hands. It's inevitable. And I love this about the word of God, that over and over again throughout the scriptures, the Bible is clear. The Bible is giving us accurate information that we are engaged in a battle. I want you to look at John chapter 16 and verse 33. This is Jesus himself speaking. John chapter 16 and verse 33. How many of you have already realized as you've been walking with Jesus that you are engaged in battle? Yeah. John chapter 16 verse 33. Look what the scripture says. Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says these words. I have told you these things so that you or so that in me you may have peace. Stop right there. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now look. If, if you just stop the scripture right there, it almost seems as if Jesus is saying, when you come to me, your life will be peaceful. You won't have any more struggle. You won't have any more battles. You won't have any more trouble. You won't have any more hardship. He, I have told you these things, he says, so that in me you may have peace. If you just stop the verse right there, it sounds like, man, I'm going to be like on this cruise ship. Anybody ever gone on a cruise before? On a cruise ship where you're just, you know, on the cruise ship, they've got water slides, they've got swimming pools, they've got all sorts of entertainment, they've got singers and magicians, and you're just chilling, and you're, man, and let me tell you, when my wife and I took a, took a cruise, um, they told me before, hey, you better, you better understand that it's all you can eat, and I was thinking to myself, it's all you can eat, really? Like, how much can you eat? I found out that week how much I could eat, because the buffets didn't close down. Morning, all you can eat. Brunch time, all you can eat. Lunch, all you can eat. Afternoon snack, all you can eat. Dinner, all you can eat. And at dinner, you get like lobster and you get like filet mignon. And you just, all you have to do is raise your hand and they bring you another lobster tail. They keep bringing it. Isn't that right? Midnight snack, the buffet doesn't end. And if you just end the verse right there, it sounds like when you come to the Lord, you just boarded a cruise ship. But keep reading the verse. I have told you these things so that you may, in me, you may have peace. Look what he says next. In this world, you will have trouble. What happened to the cruise ship? What happened to the lobster tail? I've told you these things so that you can have peace. Oh, but by the way, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're not on a cruise ship. You're on a battleship. You're not on a cruise ship. You're on a battleship. He says, but take heart. In other words, be encouraged. I've already overcome the world. This is Jesus, our commander in chief, speaking. Jesus did not give us any false expectations. And if you came to the Lord because you thought, once I come to Jesus, I'll never have a struggle. I'll never have a challenge. I'll never have difficulty. I'll never have a hardship. Can I just tell you something? Jesus never said that. As a matter of fact, he said the exact opposite. He said, in this world, you're going to have problems. But take heart. Be encouraged. 
I've already overcome the world. And if I overcame the world, I'll teach you how to do it too. So we can still have peace in the midst of storms. Your heart can be at peace even though you're engaged in a battle. Your spirit can be at rest even though every single day you are involved in warfare. These were the words of Jesus. Look at the book of Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. I want you to see from the word of God itself that the scripture is clear that we are engaged in battle. Acts chapter 14 beginning with verse 21. Verse 21 says, they, referring to Paul and Barnabas. This whole passage of scripture is speaking of the apostle Paul and his sidekick at the time, Barnabas, his helper, his assistant. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Okay, just stop right there. They were winning people. They were, they were preaching. They were ministering. And people were coming to salvation. They were hearing their words. They were hearing their message. They were believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were getting saved. Look what it says next. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. 22. Strengthening the disciples and encouraging them. Everybody say encouraging them. They were strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Now look at what their message was. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. This was their message. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Hey, if you're going to enter the kingdom of God when everything is said and done at the end of your life, you need to understand that you're going to have to face some battles. You're going to have to face some challenges. You're going to go through hardship. And the Bible says that people were getting saved with that message. Isn't that kind of contrary to a lot of times the messages that are preached from the pulpits in America today? Because in the pulpits, in many pulpits in America today, they say, hey, you can come. Well, I won't say, I won't say specific words. But they'll say things like this. You, you won't have any more problems. Come to Jesus and he'll solve everything. Come to Jesus and it's smooth sailing. Come to Jesus and you can coast through this life. My friend, let me tell you something. This life is not about coasting through it. This life is about understanding that when you came to Jesus, you enlisted in the army of Christ. And we are now soldiers in the kingdom of God. We are engaged in battle. We are engaged in warfare. We are not on a cruise ship. We are on a battleship. And it's time to make war against the heavenlies, against the kingdom of darkness. But that was their message. Hey, to enter the kingdom of God, you're going to go through many hardships. Hey, I don't know if we were to preach this message, I think that we would empty out the church. But in the book of Acts, they were getting saved with this message. And let me tell you why. Why were they getting saved with this message? Because you know what? When you give somebody false expectations... And then they go and experience life. And life kicks them in the butt sometimes. Is it okay for me to say that? Well, it's okay I said it. But if you gave somebody false expectations and then life kicks them in the butt, they come back and tell you, how come the word of God didn't work? How come what you told me wasn't right? How come Jesus didn't rescue me from this? How come Jesus didn't save me? Let me just tell you something. Jesus himself said, you're going to have trouble. But in the middle of the trouble, he was going to be right there with us because we can have peace in him. It's not about false expectations. The scripture is accurate. The scriptures are true. I'm going to give you one more. I want you to go now to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse number 6. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. The Apostle Paul is now an, an, an older man. And he knows that he is at the end of his life. He knows that his life is about to be cut. He knows that he's about to, to die. He knows that, that his life... His ministry, his experience has, uh, have all brought him to this place. But he is about to be with the Lord. He knows that he is about to die. But look at verse 7. Look at what his words are. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Do you notice what Paul was saying at the end of his life? You see, Paul, like, like many other people in this stage of life, he's reflecting 
He's reflecting on what his experiences have been. He's reflecting on what his life has been. He's reflecting on his ministry. He's reflecting on everything that he has gone through up until this point. And when at the end of it all, he's looking back at everything that happened. And these are the words that immediately come out of his mouth. I fought the good fight. Notice that he did not say, I enjoyed my retirement. I bought me a sweet boat. Nice big house, fancy car. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but his mindset was different. His mindset towards the end of his life was not to say, God, what are all the good bells and whistles and toys that I have accumulated in this life? Oh, God, look at everything that I've gained. Look at all the wealth that I acquired. Look at my house. Look at my cars. Look at my vehicles. No, 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 it wasn't any of that. You know what he said? He said, I can confidently say at the end of my life, I have fought the good fight. This life was a fight. This life was a battle. Everywhere I turned, there was opposition. Everywhere I turned, there was a struggle. Everywhere I turned, the enemy was right there. But look what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race, and I still have my faith. Wow. There was no false expectations there. Paul understood very well that he was engaged in warfare, in battle. Now, here's the question. How did he do it? How did he do it? Because I I want you to understand this. The same man that said, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. The same man that said, hey, uh, you got to put on the full armor of God. You got to put on the the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. You got to put those shoes on, those sandals on, the the, the preparation of the gospel of peace. He's the same man that said, you got to take up the sword of the spirit. The same man that said all of that is the same man that, that, that at the end of his life, he said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I kept the faith. How did he do that? How did Paul do that? He did that because he understood the power of God's word in his life. He understood the desperate need that he had for the word of God in his life. He understood. He never lost sight. He never lost the understanding. He never lost the perspective that as long as he was living in this body and as long as he was living on this earth, that he had to be engaged in warfare. He never lost sight of the fact that he could not close his eyes, that he could not let his guard down because he understood that he had a very real enemy that was wanting to steal and to kill and to destroy him. My brother, my sister, let me tell you something. Don't get so comfortable in this life and don't get so comfortable in this world that you begin to lose fact that we are engaged in warfare we have an enemy and he wants to steal from you he wants to kill you he wants to destroy you and there's nothing wrong with enjoying life there is nothing wrong with enjoying the blessings that God gives you but never lose sight of the fact that even in the midst of the blessings you have an enemy that wants to steal them from you that's why you got to take care of your family that's why you got to take care of your wife men that's why you got to take care of your husband women that's why you got to take care of your children that's why you got to intercede for your grandbabies because the enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy We can't lose sight of the fact that we're engaged in warfare. Number two, why has God given us a sword? God has given us a sword not only because he knows that we were going to be engaged in battle, but because in life he expects us to win these battles. Did you hear what I said? God expects us to win these battles. Now, we we have to define what winning means. We have to define victory. Because winning or victory is not the exemption of difficulties or hardships. Let me repeat that right now. If you win these battles or if you have victory in these battles, it does not mean that you will be exempt from them. Exemption from battles is not victory. Because if you're defining victory by exemption from difficulties, exemption from battles, that that I won't have to go through them, that I won't have to face them, that I won't have to walk through them, then let me just tell you something. You're going to be very much disappointed because that's not victory. But true victory in Jesus Christ is to say this, that whatever, whatever battle came to me, whatever struggle confronted me, whatever challenge arose in front of me, by the power of the word of God, I overcame that. That's victory right there. It's not exemption. It's not exemption. It's not to be exempt from struggle. It's not to be exempt from battles. It's not to be exempt from hardship. But to overcome them is where victory is. I want you to look at, again at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Because I believe these verses really, really begin to draw out 
the true plan and strategy and desire of our enemy. Remember, Paul, at the end of his life, he's reflecting, and he says these words, verse number 6, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. In other words, my life is, 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 is coming out of me. My life is leaving me. And at the time, uh, and the time has come for my departure. But look at verse 7. I have fought the good fight. He's saying I was engaged in battle. I kept fighting. I kept fighting. I kept fighting. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. Those two things right there, listen to me. Those two things, those last two things that he said, I finished my race and I kept the faith. That right there, why did he say that? Look, listen to me. Why did Paul say these words? Because at the end of his life, Paul was declaring victory. Have you seen Rocky before? Adrian! At the end of Paul's life, he was declaring victory. And at the end of his life, he wanted young Timothy. Because the person that he's writing to was a young man who was beginning his walk where Paul had already walked. He was beginning this, this life of faith that Paul was already ending. He was beginning this warfare, this battle that Paul was already concluding. And at the end of his life, Paul, almost like with his hands raised, he is declaring victory. I fought the good fight. I never stopped fighting. I never stopped struggling. I never stopped battling. I never lost sight of the fact that I was engaged in warfare. I fought the good fight. But look what he says next. I ran my race. I kept the faith. Why did he say those last two things? Because Paul understood that that was the true purpose and that was the true desire of his enemy. To cause Paul to stop running his race and to cause Paul to abandon his hope. You hear that? Every spiritual battle that you have ever faced and that you will ever face from this day forward, there is only one purpose that your enemy has. To cause you to stop running your race and to cause you to abandon your faith. I'm going to repeat that. Every spiritual battle that you have ever had to confront or you will ever have to confront from this day forward, your enemy only has one purpose, to get you to stop running your race and to get you to abandon your faith. This is why I am telling you that victory is not whether you are exempt from battles or not. Victory is not based on whether you are exempt from a struggle, from a hardship or not. But true victory is this, that when everything is said and done, you can say, devil, you didn't win. Satan, you didn't have your way because I never stopped running my race and I never abandoned my faith. Today, I still believe that Jesus is Lord and that he sits on his throne and that God prevails over evil all the time. So don't get frustrated when the battle is raging in your life. Don't be shocked and surprised when you are under attack from the enemy. Okay, and, and let me just tell you this. You don't always have to tell the whole world when the enemy is attacking you. Because if you go around always telling the whole world, the enemy's attacking me, the enemy's attacking me, the enemy's attacking me. The enemy, I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you right now. I'm going to tell you, no, duh. You don't have to say the enemy's attacking me. We know the enemy's attack. You are part of the army of God. It's his job to oppose us. But greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. Listen, don't focus on your opposition. Focus on the one who gives you victory. And he does this through the power of his word. This is why Paul said, hey, he has given us the sword of the spirit. You're going to need to know this sword. You're going to need to understand the word of God. You're going to need to stake your life on the word of God. You're gonna, there's going to be times where it feels like everything is crumbling around you. And it feels like everyone has turned their back on you. But in those moments, you have to understand that heaven and earth may pass away. But the word of God will never pass away. You've got to know the word of God in your heart. It is power. It is power. Wow. 
This is why Paul said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You've been fighting with your husband, with your wife. And those arguments seem like they're just over and over again. And it seems like you're arguing over the same thing over and over again. Let me just remind you, that's not your enemy. Your enemy is the one who's trying to bring destruction to your marriage. The enemy is the one who's trying to bring destruction to your family. Don't look at your husband. Don't look at your wife and view them as your enemy. The enemy is Satan himself who wants to destroy what God joined together. But Jesus says what God has joined together, let no man separate. Nobody can separate what God brought together. Don't get frustrated with your doctor because your doctor gave you a diagnosis and you're there saying, oh my God, well, how could you tell me that? Don't get frustrated with your doctor. You just it, it, Listen to what your doctor is saying, but you tell your doctor this, thank you very much for what you have told me. I know you have done your job and you're doing it well, but let me tell you this, by his stripes I am healed. You've got to know the word of God. Okay. When in your heart and in your spirit, you feel like you have no peace and you don't understand what's going on and it feels like your life is chaotic. Hey, you look at that situation, you look at that problem in your life and you tell that thing this, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory that is in Christ Jesus. You just have to know where you stand because the word of God is truth. It is the sword of the spirit. And ultimately, here's what it is. The enemy ultimately wants you to quit running your, your race and want to get you to abandon your faith. So along life's journey and along life's path, you are going to be tempted to stop running your race. So what does that mean, to stop running my race? To stop running my race means this. I'm not going to work anymore because nobody appreciates it. Throw in the towel. I'm not going to serve anymore because nobody sees it. I throw in the towel. Share my testimony with people. I'm not going to share it with anybody. Throw in the towel. Serve other people. I'm not gonna, they want me to go to church to serve. I'm not going to serve nobody. They need to serve me. I throw in the towel. You see, that's, that's stopping from running your race because this is what your race is. Your race is this, that God gave you power and God gave you authority and God gave you talents and God gave you abilities. God gave you words in your mouth and if you hold them in, there are people that will never hear what you have to say. God gave you hands to serve, but if you just sit on them, there are people who will never live in the blessing that your hands could provide for them. God gave you feet so that they would take you to share the good news with other people. But if you keep your feet planted just in one place, never willing to go, never willing to share, never willing to ex expand yourself for the sake of other people, let me just tell you something. You are withholding the advancement of the kingdom of God. That is your race. Your race is to be a good father. Your race is to be a good mother. Your race is to be good grandparents. Your race is to be a good servant in the kingdom of God. That is your race. Don't stop. Do like the guy who just started running and he did not stop running and he kept running and he kept running. You know who I'm talking about, Forrest Gump. <laughs> and they asked him, why are you running? And he just said, I don't know, I just like it. <laughs> hey, keep running your race. Keep running your race because that's what the enemy wants. He'll bring these battles, he'll bring these struggles, but he wants you to quit running your race. And if you stop running your race, it's only a matter of time before you abandon your faith. Because if you stop running your race, then you start looking at brother so-and-so, and you start looking at sister so-and-so, and how they didn't appreciate you, and how they didn't welcome you, and how they didn't uh, talk to you, and how they didn't greet you, and how they didn't acknowledge when you served them, and how they didn't acknowledge when you worked for them. And here's what happens. Bitterness comes in, and it causes you to hate that person, and it causes you to hate the church, and it causes you to hate the kingdom of God. And before you know it, you abandon your faith. That's how the enemy works. And here we are thinking, it's not my fault, it's their fault. No, you just fell to the trap of the enemy. Why? Because you didn't know that you had in your hand the sword of the spirit. The word of God. 
Number three, why has God given us the sword of the spirit? God has given us a sword because he expects us to know our weapon. God expects us to know our weapon. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. I want you to see this. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Do your best. Everybody say your best. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Notice what the scripture there says. Do your best. Get with the word of God. And do your best to present yourself before the Lord as a worker who does not need to be ashamed. You know what that's saying? Study. Study the word of God to the best of your ability. Study your weapon to the best of your ability. Investigate the word of God. Get to know the word of God to the best of your ability. Do your best. I want you to ask your neighbor, are you doing your best? Are you doing your best to know the word of God? Are you doing your best to be in the word of God? Are you doing your best to study the weapon that God has given you? Are you doing your best to train in warfare through the word of God? Are you doing your best? The honest answer probably for many people is no. I'm not doing my best. I'm not reading as I should. I'm not studying as I should. I'm not seeking God through his word as I should. A true soldier has to know his weapon. The Roman soldiers of Paul's day, and, and when Paul was describing the, the, the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, when he's describing that, when he's describing the sword of the spirit, Paul is describing the ancient Roman soldier. He's describing the, the, the vesture, the, 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 the battle gear of the Roman soldier. The Roman soldiers of Paul's days were, were to go through extensive training to learn how to use their sword. I want to read for you an excerpt of a book. Uh, it's called Ancient Roman Culture and Customs. It's a book that I have just for studying purposes. But I want to read this excerpt for you. The Roman gladius, and the gladius is the name of the, of the sword that the Roman soldiers used. The Roman gladius has become known as as the sword that conquered the world. Adapted from a Spanish design, the prowess of the gladius in close-range combat made it a fearsome tool in the hand of a skilled Roman warrior. When sharpened, I want you to hear this, when sharpened, its dual edges wreaked havoc on unarmed foes, while its tapered point could pierce through even the heaviest of metal armor. The sword itself, listen to this, was masterful and impressive. But the sword in the hand of a skilled soldier who had trained extensively in its use became a weapon that was feared by opposing enemies. I want to repeat that statement. The sword itself was masterful and impressive. But the sword in the hand of a skilled soldier who had trained extensively in its use, became a weapon that was feared by opposing enemies. I wonder if your opposing enemy fears the word of God in your life. I wonder if your opposing enemy knows that you know, that he knows, that you know, that God knows, that you know. His word. I wonder if the enemy knows about your life and my life. Uh-oh, I better think twice about coming against them because they have hidden God's word in their heart that they may not sin against him. Uh-oh, I don't know if I should do this. Uh-oh, I don't know if I should execute this plan because I know that they know where they stand. I know they've been studying the word of God. I know that they've been reading the word of God. I know that they've been investigating the scriptures. I wonder if the enemy fears us because he knows that we have the word of God hidden in our heart. Or I wonder if when the enemy looks at us, he just chuckles. <laughs> They think Sunday morning sermon is going to do it for them. <laughs> the pastors have been saying for a month now to read the Bible, and they've only picked it up a handful of times. <laughs> they think they have power. They think they have authority, but they don't even know where it's based on because they don't open up the Bible to read it. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder. 
Or does the enemy look at us and he says, they know too much. You see, the word of God is a masterful and impressive weapon. But when the word of God is placed in the hands of a skilled soldier, someone who has trained extensively how to use the sword of the spirit, the word of God, that becomes a fearful thing in the eyes of our enemy. I don't know about you, but my desire is to become a skilled soldier who has trained extensively how to use the weapon that God has given me. I want to be a soldier that is well prepared because I don't want to be engaged in a battle and find that I'm unprepared when I'm confronting the enemy. I don't want to be engaged in sickness or in disease and find that I've been unprepared and that I'm, I'm tempted to stop running my race and to abandon my faith because I don't know why this happened and what's going on in my life. Hey, I want to be prepared for whatever struggle, whatever challenge, whatever warfare the enemy wants to bring against me. I know where I stand because I have been in the word of God and I know how to use the sword of the spirit. I want to be prepared. With this I close. I invite our, our worship team to come. The Bible says, Paul said under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. I want you to hear this. It's the sword of the Spirit. Another way that you can say that is the word of God is the Spirit's sword. Okay? In other words, this is, this is my phone. This is the phone of Robert. You can't have it. Don't even think about it. This is the phone of Robert. It's Robert's phone. A way that you can say that, a phone of Robert. The Bible says, Paul said, that the, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. Another way that you can say that, it's the spirit's sword. It's not, I want you to hear this. It's not only the sword of the soldier. It's not only the sword of the believer. More than that, although that's true, greater than that, it is the sword of the spirit. It's the sword that belongs to the spirit of God. If you wrap your mind around this, this is what the scripture is saying. This is what Paul is saying. The Holy Spirit has taken his own sword and he has placed it into your hands. The sword of the spirit. Why is that so impressive? Why is that so important? Because I can tell you're real impressed by that. I want you to hear this. Because 2,000 years ago, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus already paid the price for your salvation. But today, 2,000 2, years later, when somebody hears, listen to me, the word of God, and they believe and accept and receive the word of God, this is what the Holy Spirit does. Because God lives outside of time and space. And he's given you the sword of the spirit, the spirit's sword, which is the word of God. Here's what happens. When you hear the word of God, and when you accept it, and when you receive it, here's what the Holy Spirit does. He goes back in time, 2,000 years, to the cross, and he picks up the salvation that Jesus purchased when he shed his blood for you. And then he comes back to the year 2016, and he gives you your salvation. Why? Because the sword of the Spirit was in operation. You believed the word of God, you trusted it, and you received it. He goes back in time, and because of the word, the sword of the Spirit, he brings you your salvation. It's not your sword. It's the Spirit's sword. He's lending it to us. What does that mean? Healing? Healing's arisen. Healing, you know, sickness has come into your life and the enemy is bringing the, the battle of sickness. Huh, I've got the answer for that. Because the scripture says that by his stripes that they place on his back, we are healed. So when you receive the word of God and you know where you stand, here's what the Holy Spirit does. He takes his sword and he goes back in time. And he goes on the back of Jesus, on the stripes where they whipped him. And he brings the healing that was purchased for you back then. And he brings it into the year 2016. And he says there, by the sword of the Spirit, here's your healing. You see, it's not just your sword. It's not my sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's the Spirit's sword. Why does he do that? So that he can go back 
And whatever it is that you need, whether it's salvation, whether it's deliverance, whether it's healing, whether it's restoration, you see, everything was purchased already at the cross of Calvary. So he goes, and he, with the sword of the Spirit, he fights through every demonic force. He fights through every demonic spirit. Everything that would want to stop the healing, the salvation, the deliverance, the restoration, forget it to you. And he goes and he picks it up, and then he turns around, and with the sword of the Spirit, he brings it back to your current situation. He brings it back to your life. He brings it back to your marriage. He brings it back to your family, and he brings it to you. Why? Because it's not your sword. It's his sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit is what works. Why? Because we are not fighting on a physical realm. We are fighting on a spiritual realm. And I can't fight these things on my own. I need the sword that the Spirit of God himself will give me. But when I get the sword, the Word of God, and when I read it, and when I study it, and when I apply it to my life, and when I stand my ground, and when I stand firm, regardless of what I feel, regardless of what I see, regardless of what I hear, I know what the Word of God says. And I'm standing on it. And I can look Satan in his eye. And I can say, I know what this looks like. It looks like destruction but God says that I have victory I'm gonna stand my ground I know what this looks like this looks like death this looks like sickness this looks like disease but I know what God has already given me by the power of the Spirit of the Lord I have healing I know what this looks like it looks like my marriage is destroyed but I'm gonna stand my ground I know what the Word of God says I know what this looks like it looks like my children will never serve the Lord it looks like my grandchildren will abandon the faith but I know what the Word of God says that when I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ I would be saved and my household I know what the Word of God says it is a sword of the spirit and whatever you need to bring devil to try to get me to stop running my race or to abandon my faith I have victory because of the sword of the spirit of God that is in my life the sword of the spirit Father we thank you Father we thank you for your word the power of your word it is the sword of the spirit God you have taken the weapon that belongs to the Holy Spirit. The Word of God. And you have placed it in my hands. That means that today, God, I don't have to fear. I don't have to be worried. I don't have to be doubting. No wonder, Jesus, you said that in this world we would have many troubles. But in the midst of them, we can have peace because of your word. And you told us that we didn't have to fear because you already overcame the world. No wonder, God. No wonder I can stand firm regardless of what's happening in my life, regardless of what I'm experiencing, regardless of what has been told to me, and regardless of what my eyes are seeing. No wonder, God, I can stand firm because your word is truth. It is a sword of the Spirit. And this battle that has been raging in my life, this battle that has risen up against me, I will not fear, I will not doubt, I will not stop running my race, and I will not abandon my faith. But just like Paul, when everything is said and done, I will be able to say, I have fought the good fight, I have run my race, and I have finished the faith. God, I just pray, give me strength that I may train, that I may train, that I may study, that I may read, that I might investigate, God, your word. I pray, Father, that every day I would be a student of your word, that I would train with my weapon, that I would learn how to use it, Lord God, because the secret to success in this battle is your word in my life. Would you stand with me, please?